How are you doing Rock Church and welcome to our summer series at the movies. My name is Mike and I am the online campus pastor and the reason you saw all these beautiful women behind me is because we're going to be talking about the movie today, Miss Congeniality. Uh, if you haven't watched our services live, I want to encourage you on Sunday to check out our live services at online.sdrock.com or if you live in San Diego County, go ahead and visit one of our physical sites to hear Pastor Miles give an amazing sermon for the At The Movie series. So for Miss Congeniality, I want to tell you a little bit about what this movie's about. It's about a woman named Gracie who's a New York cop, played by Sandra Bullock, and she's a typical tough New York lady. She doesn't take any business from anybody, she's known for breaking the rules, and she's a rough chick. Eventually, uh, she, she ends up getting into a situation where they're trying to track down and solve a crime of a, of a terrorist who's having bomb threats all around in different areas of the city. And they end up tracking down one of the clues that he gives and finding out that he's gonna be at a beauty pageant. Now this is where we pick up in the story where Gracie ends up being the main candidate to go undercover as a, as a beauty pageant contestant and she's gonna have to try to solve this crime. Now what, we, what ends up happening with Gracie is since she's such a tough lady, she can't imagine being in a position where she's gonna have to be feminine and do uh, wear makeup and dresses and heels. It's just not in her comfort zone at all. But she ends up actually meeting some great people and, and accomplishing one of her greatest accomplishments in life through this beauty pageant. So what I wanna talk to you about today is how we do that all the time in our lives. We put limits on what the ultimate plan is for our life because we can't imagine doing that. We say, God, you can't do that. Or we say, I don't believe that I can do that. So what I wanna talk to you about today is how you can take the limits off of God's plan for your life. So like I said, I wanna to talk to you about how we can take the limits off of God in our own life. Uh, I'm married, I've been married for nine years to my wife Brianna and I have three amazing kids and we've been through a ton of ups and downs in our marriage and in our life. And I'm sure you can relate to that. And there's been many times where we've completely unlimited God and we've, we've believed that God was gonna come through and he did. And there were times where we completely lacked faith. Um, just recently, it was our time to move houses and it seemed like there was nothing anywhere available in our neighborhood, in our area where we wanted to move. And we just completely lost faith for whatever reason that God was gonna show up and that he was gonna do something. And I remember I was in Alabama at the time. We live in San Diego area and my wife was gonna go look at a home and she was really stressed out. The kids were of course going crazy that day. Um, the printer wasn't working and she was supposed to print stuff out. Everything was falling apart. And finally, she ended up just throwing all the kids in the car, as, as messy as they were, just threw them in the car, drove to the house. And by the time she got there, every other applicant for the house ended up not showing up. So she was the only applicant that showed up to the house. And on top of that, the person who was showing the house, the, the agent who was showing the house off was, was actually a friend of a friend. So we actually knew him and he showed us around the house and we... We just ended up looking at God and just saying, God, why do we limit you sometimes? Why do we lack faith in your plan? So what I wanna do is I wanna tell you about a character in the Bible who at one point completely unlimited God. He had full faith in God that God was gonna do amazing things. And then another time where he put total limits on himself and total limits on God. And we see a bit of failure in his life as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. And we're gonna talk about the prophet Elijah. Verse 17 of chapter 18, it says, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab said to the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. 
Okay, so we look at this prophet Elijah. He's a prophet of God. He's this extremely bold man of God. And then we have this man named Ahab. And Ahab is the king of Israel. So you can imagine that at this time, Ahab was one of the most powerful people in the world. And Elijah goes up to him, no problem, and says, you are the reason that Israel's having trouble. You are the reason because of your sin. So let's gather all of these evil prophets together and I wanna have a standoff on the mountain. This is the boldness that Elijah had. Not only that, he didn't have any backup from his people. Everybody turned his back against him. He didn't, he didn't know what support he had. And he came out to all of his own people, all the children of Israel and said, are you going to take a stand? What are you going to do? Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow Baal? And he, he puts a huge test on the mountain. And you can imagine the faith it takes for a man to challenge the king, to challenge all of his own people, and to completely put God to the test on top of a mountain, right? Everybody's watching all of Israel and they put their sacrifices on the altar and they pray to their gods to see which God will show up. And of course, the true God of Israel shows up, fire comes down from heaven, licks up the water in the altar, and it's this amazing victory that we get to see when Elijah unlimits God. I mean, what a powerful story of, of not putting limits on God and who he is, right? Elijah is one of my favorite characters in the Bible, and his name actually means the Lord is my God, and he definitely demonstrated it here. Um, as, we, as we look at Gracie in, the, in this movie, Miss Congeniality, um, she had amazing talents and amazing skills. But when it was her opportunity to do something that was out of her comfort zone, she put limits on what she believed that she could do. And she put limits on what she believed the plan could be for her life. And her greatest victory in her career actually came from this uncomfortable, awkward situation. Right, what I wanna do is I wanna read on just a few verses later in the next chapter, Elijah gets confronted with a situation where he puts limits on God and he actually runs with fear. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read in 1 Kings 19, chapter one through three, or verse one through three. It says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so, May the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as a life of one of those this time tomorrow. And he was afraid and he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So you've got this amazing man named Elijah. He just had this amazing victory on the mountain. And all of a sudden, the king's wife says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And Elijah runs with fear. Now this woman Jezebel must have been a scary lady. I don't know what she looked like or what kind of what kind of attitude she had, but he was fearful and he ran for his life. Now this is the same exact person who just before that took on a bunch of scary prophets of Baal, prophets of Asherah, these evil prophets, and took them on no problem. Not only that, he went to the king face to face and said, you are the reason that Israel's suffering. But yet, all of a sudden he gets a threat and he runs for his life. All, what he did was he said, God, I'm gonna put limits on you. Right? I'm gonna, I don't believe that you're going to save me and help me through this situation. Uh, very similarly to the way that uh, when we were trying to look for a house, we said, God, there's no way that you're going to come through. There's no rentals available. There's nothing available in our area. We're going to be homeless. We're, woe is me. Everything's going to fall apart. But yet we put faith in God at the end and God ended up coming through. Even in our faithlessness, God came through and showed how amazing that he was. And Elijah ran and he put limits on God. So what I wanna do is I wanna just share with you a little bit of a, a couple things that we could do to remove the limits of God in our own life. Number one, know that if God has done it before, he can do it again. That's something that's so important that we know, right? That we need to know. And I think the children of Israel really understood this because whenever they would see an amazing victory, they would build an altar to the Lord. Right, when, when Joshua crossed over the Jordan River and the Lord stopped the water, the water literally stopped in the Jordan River and they were able to walk across on dry land. They said, let's take out 12 huge stones. Let's stack them up so that every, whenever generations after generations come and they see these stones, they'll remember, look at what the Lord did to help the children of Israel cross the Jordan. Now, I want you to think about your own life right now. What are some things that you know for a fact God has done in your life? Uh, maybe he's helped you find a mate. Maybe he's helped you find a house or a job. Maybe he's gotten you through a really tough situation in your life. There's a whole bunch of different things that you know that God had a hand in it. Maybe he saved your life before. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take, into, take the practice of opening up a journal, 
Get a new journal, find a journal that you can write in all the things that God has done in your life. Because when you start reflecting on all the things God has done in the past, you'll start believing more heavily what God can do in the future. So remember, what God has done before, he's gonna do it again. So let's practice writing those things down. Number two is we need to get comfortable being in uncomfortable situations, right? Like we talked about Gracie. Gracie was pushed into an extremely uncomfortable situation and she wanted to run for the hills. Over and over again, she tried to quit. She didn't want to do it, but yet this is where her, her greatest victory came from. And on top of that, she met some great people and learned so much about herself. God is gonna put you in uncomfortable situations. What we need to do is not hope that God makes us comfortable, because that's just not how God works. God puts us in uncomfortable situations because he knows that's how we're gonna grow, right? Think about Joseph. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Old Testament Joseph. He ends up getting beat up by his brothers, thrown into a pit. They end up saying, well, maybe we shouldn't kill him. So the second best thing is we'll sell him into slavery. And he goes to Egypt and when he's in Egypt, he's in Potiphar's house and he ends up working his way up the ladder a bit and then Potiphar's wife, has eyes for him and starts lusting over him and starts falsely accusing him of, of trying to sleep with her. And so he ends up in jail and he ends up in jail for two years. Can you imagine getting beat up by your own brothers, getting sold into slavery and having to be a slave in a land where you know nobody. And then finally, once things start going well for you, you get put into prison, right? And then eventually, Joseph's character was formed so much that he ends up accomplishing an amazing task and saving Israel, the entire nation of Israel was saved because of Joseph's faithfulness and God chose to put him in extremely uncomfortable situations in order to shape him and mold him into the man of God that he was to become. So press into uncomfortable situations. I want you to think right now, what is an uncomfortable situation that you're in right now? Maybe you're living with a family member that you don't want to live with. Uh, how can you press into that situation and really, really see what God wants to shape you in through that? Maybe you're not making as much money. You're not in the career that you want to be in right now and your job is difficult and you have a manager that has it out for you and doesn't like you. How can you press into that situation? What is going on in your life personally where instead of just being frustrated about what's going on, you can ask God and say, God, what do you want to show me through this? How can I make sure that I come out on the other side of this uncomfortable situation stronger and more like your son, Jesus Christ? The last thing I want you to do is know who God is, right? It's super simple. Um, it's a super simple thing, but it's something that takes a lot of practice and a lot of effort to understand. Uh, think about the people that you know in your life extremely well. Maybe it's, maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a, a son or daughter, maybe it's a best friend that just knows you super well, right? You didn't get to know that person so well just by meeting them or by maybe having coffee once or twice with them. You probably know that person intimately because you spend a ton of time with them. So my encouragement to you is to spend a ton of time with God. Get to know him like a friend, get to know him personally. Spend time reading his word in the morning. When you wake up, spend an hour with him in the morning. Spend a half hour with him. Spend 10 minutes with him. Just get to know him better. Spend time in prayer with him. Listen to his voice, right? You're gonna, you're gonna understand and know his voice so much better when you go into tough situations if you're listening to him every day, even when things are good, right? And I wanna encourage you that we can't truly limit God. We actually can't put limits on God. God is limitless. So if we try to limit him, that's just, it's gonna be a fail on our part. All we can do is limit our understanding of him or limit the potential that God's gonna do in our life. So, so what I, my encouragement to you is press in, get to know God extremely well because he's gonna connect with you. And the more that you know God, the less limits you're gonna place on him because you're gonna realize how unlimited and how amazing and how all powerful all knowing and all loving our God is. Okay, and last but not least, I just wanna recap these three things that you're gonna take on. One, know that if God has done it before, he's gonna do it again. Number two, we need to get comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And last but not least, know who God is. If you practice these three things, you're going to begin to unlimit God in your life. And when you take the limits off of God and, and what he can do in your life, you'll be amazed by how he will blow your mind. So hopefully you enjoyed this, this, this unlimiting God recap of Miss Congeniality, and I hope to see you all real soon at our next At The Movies. God bless you. 
if God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, Dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know, and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.